of the Chicago Architecture Foundation. I'm Ian Spiele with the Public Programs Department. Uh, it's my privilege today to welcome Arnold Randall, Arnold Randall excuse me, uh, General Superintendent of the Forest Preserves of Cook County to CAF to share details of the district's ambitious next century conservation plan. Uh, I want to say a special thanks before we get going um, to all the members in attendance here uh, for your steady commitment to daytime talks and to other CAF programming. Um, you're really key to driving our success, so thank you. Uh, before we introduce Arnold, um, let me just buzz through a, a couple of upcoming programs here at CAF. Uh, so our next evening lecture takes place on May 22nd with noted Chicago architect John Ronan. Uh, John will share details on newer work with a focus on three innovative projects in development, a hybrid branch library and affordable housing structure on the northwest side um, that's part of a, a CPL CHA pilot program. Uh, IIT's Innovation Center, which I know is, is coming along nicely, and the nearly complete office tower at 151 North Franklin. Uh, that, I believe that delivers this spring. Uh, and then if you'll join us again on May 30th, we have a, we just added a, an exciting architect talk with Matt Cash of Heatherwick Studio. Uh, the globally renowned firm um, is in the midst of several bold projects, including new Google headquarters in California and in London. Uh, a contemporary art museum in Cape Town that makes use of a, uh, makes new use of a disused grain silo. Um, and then also the Pier 55 park project um, in Lower Manhattan. Um, so these, <coughs> along with many other Heatherwick Studio projects, represent the firm's great imagination um, for urban placemaking. Uh, tickets for these and other events are available, of course, at architecture.org or by calling or visiting the CAF box office. Uh, for the time being, still located right across the way. <laughs> Arnold Randall is General Superintendent of the Forest Preserves of Cook County and is responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the nation's oldest and largest forest preserve system. He has helped develop and execute strategic plans for camping, recreation, trails, and habitat restoration, launched a multi-year centennial celebration to bring new and diverse audiences to the preserves, and expanded the preserve's important role in the scientific and academic communities. Arnold previously served as director of the Office of Civic Engagement at the University of Chicago. He led the Chicago 2016 Olympic Bid Committee's Neighborhood Legacy Team and worked as commissioner of the City of Chicago's Department of Planning and Development. Please help me welcome Arnold. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with you again. My name is Arnold Randall, and I'm the uh, General Superintendent of the Forest Preserves of Cook County. And I want to thank the Chicago Architecture Foundation for uh, inviting us, uh, inviting me to, to come out and speak and tell you a little bit about the Forest Preserves um, and some of the things we're working on. I'm going to start with a, a short clip from a uh, documentary that was done about the Forest Preserves, award-winning uh, Emmy award-winning uh, documentary about the Forest Preserves of Cook County. But this is a a short clip to give you some sense of what the forest preserves look like and what we're about. So I'll go ahead and start that right now. People in the city don't really know about the forest preserves. They're kind of a, a wonderful green emerald ring around the city. The forest preserves are owned by the taxpayers it's about 69,000 acres, 11 percent of our land. It's a wonderful, wonderful asset. You're out here, you can hear the wind in the trees, you can hear the birds. So it's very, very peaceful. This is one of the oldest forest preserve districts in the United States and the largest forest preserve district in the United States. Drive in and set up a, a picnic, unload your bike, go for a swim at uh, one of our aquatic centers, or take, bring out your fishing pole. All of these things are accessible to everybody for free 365 days a year. Beyond just active recreation is the conservation side of the preserve and the aspect of land management. We're the last bastion in many cases for certain plants and animals that, that really are only found here in the forest preserves of Cook County. Zoonotic disease represents the fastest growing infectious disease in the world today, and about 75% of the new diseases are zoonotic, those that are transmitted from animals to humans. Sea bombing is 
just taking the um, seeds of a flower and then you pack it all into some soil and some flour and you take it home and you can throw it out into a vacant lot or a garden in your front yard and just give it to them to grow and it blooms into one of these flowers here. I see myself working with the forest preserves. It's just so great to see children excited about being outdoors and so that they can learn from a young age because the future of our earth is with the children. have this kind of open space so close to a major metropolis is really unheard of. The more people are connected and have an appreciation for it, the more people will want to protect it and even enhance it and even grow it. A lot of people have lost some of their uh, roots of being outdoors. This is something that's a treasure that we need to protect in the long term and that it is of value to them. So that was a clip from the video. I'm sorry the sound wasn't as, as, as loud as we've liked, but you get a sense of, in looking at the, uh, uh, the video, uh, of what the forest preserves look like. And we work with a uh, local public broadcasting station, uh, WYCC, uh, to produce something that showed uh, a year-round sort of look at what the forest preserves look like, some of the things that we do. And if you're interested in seeing the full video, it's on our website. Uh, the link to it is on our website, and you get a chance to take a look at it. It's about, uh, just about an hour long, and, and certainly there's a shorter version if you want to look at the shorter version as well. Um, just in talking about who we are and what we do, so biodiversity is, is a term that you probably don't hear every day unless you're, you're out in the forest preserves or other places, but really sort of looking at the ecological health of, of these areas. And so these are natural areas, they're not just breathtaking, they're beautiful. Uh, I hope you saw some of that in the video. Uh, but in a restored state, they serve to have several important functions uh, beyond just being beautiful. Uh, they provide clean drinking water and clean air. They even flood prevention during heavy rainfalls. Of the 102 counties in Illinois, as you know, there's 102 counties in Illinois, believe it or not, Cook County is the most ecologically diverse. It's most diverse people-wise, which we would all guess and say right away, but it's certainly the most ecologically diverse. We're home to oak woodlands and wetlands and prairies uh, and savannas. And these habitats not only help people, but they also are habitats for all sorts of animals and plants and endangered species that exist only in the forest preserve system. Uh, while conservation is our main mission, the forest preserves also provide year-round programming, and that's part of our mission, programming and activities for individuals, families, and groups. Most of our programmed events are, are free by far. 90-something uh, percent of our, our events and activities are free. Uh, but we, and we offer an affordable and safe way to stay active outdoors while opening a door to the, na the natural world that's all around us. And sometimes being here in the heart of downtown, it's hard to imagine it as I was riding a divvy bike over in here and all the honking horns and all that. Uh, we do have this really close, and it's an escape for all of us. Um, also part of the Forest Preserve System are the Brookfield Zoo. Chicago Zoological Society runs the Brookfield Zoo and the Chicago Botanic Garden. Uh, they are partners, but they, they sit on Forest Preserve land, and we also fund a, a good portion of their operating budget on an annual basis. Um, we have a unique public-private uh, partnership with both of these world-class institutions. Um, they raise a lot of private money. They do a wonderful job. They're, they're, well, they're known around the world, not just the region, and are, are great attractions for the, for the local economy as well. Um, one of the special things about the Forest Preserve is that there's a lot of opportunity for unstructured activity and enjoyment. And so uh, I used to work for the parks uh, here in Chicago for many years, and uh, they do a wonderful job in providing recreational opportunities. Um, we're a little bit of a counterpoint to that where we, there's a lot of opportunities just to get out on a trail yourself, to do some bird watching, to do some hiking, fishing, all sorts of things. We have more than 300 miles of trail in the Forest Preserve. About half of that's paved. The rest are 
kind of what you see here in this picture, a lot of those types of either dirt or, or stone trails, and they're available year-round for, for any of us to use. Uh, and they're close. I think there's a perception by a lot of folks, and myself included, before I started working in the Forest Preserve System, that they're really far away. They're not far at all. They're 20 to 30 minutes away, a car ride away. Uh, we actually have about 3,500 acres that are in the city proper, um, but the vast majority are in the surrounding suburbs. Uh, the concept of escaping stress of urban life uh, was really a driver uh, for the, the creation of the Forest Preserve, for Forest Preserve System about 100 years ago. We're over 100 years old now. We're actually older than the national parks. Uh, we were established before the national parks were. And we had some visionary local leaders and Dwight Perkins and Jens Jensen and, and a number of the other folks. Uh, and the Forest Preserves were contemplated in the 1909 plan of Chicago. So if you look at the, look at the I actually went back and, and, and looked at it a little bit before this presentation. Uh, that outer ring of open space was contemplated um, in that plan and, and came and came to fruition. Um, we've been lucky to have very forward-thinking people in Chicago, believe it or not, and um, uh, very visionary people in, in, in our history and, and throughout our history. And so the Forest Preserves is really the manifestation of some of that. Uh, we're at nearly 70,000 acres of land. Uh, if you just to give you some context, that's about 11% of the county footprint. So if you looked at a map of the county, about 11% are made up of forest preserves. Um, the park district, just to give you some other context, we put all the city parks together in the lakefront, they're about 9,500 acres, and we're at about 70,000. So it's really big, uh, for lack of a better word. We, we divide it up into zones um, because we recognize that when we talk about the forest preserves, you may just be interested in the preserves that are closest to where you live. And uh, so we, we try to make it zone based and some of the program, you know, program guides which are on the back table, you may have seen them are broken up into zones. Uh, and they make us healthier communities. They give an opportunity for us to get outdoors and breathe fresh air and, and, and certainly for plants and animals to exist. I'll give you a little bit of a history lesson. So um, while 70,000 acres is a lot of land, it's important to provide some context and why it's important to have this type of open space so close to an urban center. That's what makes the forest preserves in Cook County different. Uh, you have this type of open space so close to a major city like Chicago. That is unusual. Um, back between uh, 1804 and 1803, you see that most of Cook County is undeveloped. So that green uh, is undeveloped land. And uh, the darker green are you know, forest preserve, or more forested areas. Uh, in the 19, late 1930s, there's a lot less green. There's a lot more development. You see the, the really the outline of the city and the red being the development of, of you know, kind of more developed spaces like we see today. Uh, and the yellow is agriculture. So it's changed a lot even in that period between the, the mid-1800s and the uh, mid-1930s. And uh, you see a lot of the green space really at risk and gone and, and sort of decimated in some ways. And remember, the forest preserves were formed in 1915. So, um, if they weren't, more of that green space would have probably been gone as well. Jump ahead to the 80s. Uh, we see even less agriculture, so the yellow is going away. There's a lot more red, and you see that the development has, taken, has really taken place and uh, expanded well beyond the city limits, and that's uh, more current. And so you see a lot of development out now and out in the suburbs, and the only green or a lot of the green that's left is Forest Preserve. You know, certainly some, some parks, but the Forest Preserve is sort of what you have left in that period of time. And while that seems like a long time, it's really not. And we've lost a lot. Uh, but it really points out to us why the forest preserves are really important to protect. Um, and our city parks are really important to protect over time. This kind of just gives you a side by side of what it looks like um, and what we've lost over time and why some of the problems we have today are a result of, of how we've developed over time. And uh, if issues of flooding and air quality all have a lot to do with development as well. Um, so, when we were thinking about uh, our relevancy and part of our challenge in the Forest Preserve is that um, we're not well connected enough to the larger public and we wanted to talk about how we're going to connect better with the larger public in the long term uh, under President Tony Preckwinkle who appointed me and she's well known as the County Board President but for our purposes she's the President of the Forest Preserve Board as well and it's a separate job and it has a separate budget and separate responsibilities. Um, we really looked at how do we uh, become more relevant uh, to a larger public and <clears throat> part of that sort of generated into a next century conservation plan and it was really in the in the heart of Burnham as far as sort of thinking big thinking long term <clears throat> this is a 25 year sort of focus for us and, and why it's important for us to focus on our mission and how we connect more people to it uh, the plan really touches on four key areas people how do we connect more people 
to the Forest Preserve system, whether they're coming or not, but just people have an appreciation for the value of having these type of open spaces so close to the city. Uh, the nature, that's really priority one, is how do we continue to protect and restore nature. We've done a lot of damage to our nature just by the fact of having five and a half million people living in Cook County. Um, things happen and a lot of things are damaged. Uh, showing the economic value of having a forest preserve system like this uh, in, the, in the Chicago area is really important and showing why there's opportunities for, for economic benefit but also just the overall sort of economic value of having this and then leadership for the long term. Uh, county government has had its challenges historically. Uh, we feel like we've moved it in the right direction under uh, President Preckwinkle's leadership and certainly the forest preserves have come a long way uh, uh, in our time working on it, but we recognize that that needs to be a long-term vision so when administrations change that we're still using good practices to maintain our land and be good stewards, not only of the land but also of the public dollars to support it. Um, one of the goals uh, on the People Committee is really working to connect more people through outdoor activities and recreation, uh, and I'm going to talk about what some of those are. The Nature's, Nature Committee's goal is to support our effort to restore <laughs> Of those 70,000 acres, restore 30,000 to good ecological health. And I'll, I'll show you some pictures as to what that means, but really removing a lot of the invasive plants and, and uh, things that have really sort of degraded our, our natural environment <coughs> in the Forest Preserve and restore those areas to good ecological health, both for our benefit, but for the, anim the, the benefit of the animals and plants that exist there. The Economics Committee is charged with showcasing the preserves and economic value through healthy benefits, nature-related services, and jobs. And the leadership committee is tasked with making sure that uh, the preserves uh, leadership is transparent, meaning me and all the leaders and all the, the folks who are elected and or appointed to be transparent and to be good stewards of the public dollar uh, and the public resources that, that we're given to, to, to run the forest preserve and maintain the forest preserves. Uh, habitat restoration. So that 30,000 acres, that's you know a big number for us. We, we currently have about 9,000 acres of are currently under active restoration management. So they're, they're either in really good ecological health or they're moving in that direction. We're actively working on them. Um, what it means is uh, you've had non-Native Americans settled here in, in this area for hundreds of years now. And, and Native Americans have lived here for at least 12,000 years. Uh, and so, but when we, we came from other parts of the world, we brought our favorite plants with us. We brought different animals with us. We brought things that really fundamentally changed the landscapes. And we planted these things and they took over and things like buckthorn and garlic mustard and uh, there's a number of different invasive plants that don't, that aren't really from here but they, they're very aggressive and they've taken over a lot of our forests and our, a lot of our, our habitats. And so we work very hard, we spend a lot of money, we work with a lot of volunteers to remove those invasive plants and allow what was here originally to thrive and start to, to, to be active again. And that has a big impact on the environment, has a big impact on water, has a big impact on the types of animals that live there as well. Um, and it's a big deal for us. It's, a big, it's one of the, the biggest things that we do as far as being a forest preserve system. Uh, we used to think that it was enough just to protect the land and set it aside, so that's one argument. But the reality is that we've already impacted the land in pretty significant ways. So if we just do nothing, it would continue to degrade and not be as healthy as it, as it could or should be. One of the big tools we use is prescribed fire. Uh, our woodlands, prairies, and savannas are fire dependent. That sounds counterintuitive. Why would you set fire to, <laughs> to, uh, to nature? It sounds uh, uh, like not the right thing to do. But historically, fire occurred naturally throughout the landscapes, through lightning strikes and, 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 and such, and was also used strategically by native peoples uh, for thousands of years uh, to, to maintain the land. Today, prescribed burning is an important management tool for us, uh, for our natural areas, which mimics the wildfires that our native prairies and woodlands have adapted to over a millennia. Fire removes uh, invasive plants. They apply prescribed fire in small settings, and many times contractors and our own staff, and volunteers in some cases, are used in large-scale restoration projects. I'll give you some pictures of before and after. So the before shows you uh, kind of this jungle, this thicket of buckthorn that really sort of chokes out native trees and plants and doesn't allow enough light to get to the floor of the forest and so that means other things don't grow. They can't or their their growth is stunted. Once it's removed then you see a more open open area. You see some plants that are native that are starting to grow. You have more openness and more light coming to. This is uh, Deer Grove in Palatine. Deer Grove is our oldest uh, is our oldest preserve or the preserve the first parcel land that was bought by the forest preserves in 1916. Uh, the next one is uh, Dalton Prairie. This is out in the south suburbs in Dalton kind of a before and after, just a lot of sort of overgrowth, un, you know, unhealthy 
landscapes and what you get. Illinois is known as a prairie state, but we have less than one tenth of one percent of prairies that existed pre-settlement that exist today. So, and some of those are in the forest preserves of Cook County. So it's important that we, we the ones that we do have that are remnant, which means they've never been touched or farmed, we really we need to protect and maintain. Uh, this is Sand Ridge out in Calumet City, so you see some uh, some of the native plants here doing well in the in the before and after here. Um, the Forest Preserves of Cook County has 23 dedicated Illinois Nature Preserves. That's the highest protection that the state of Illinois um, assigns to native landscapes. Um, we have 23, so that's by far the largest number of any any organization that may, that has uh, Illinois Nature Preserve designations. Uh, you know, other forest preserves around us have some as well, but we have the largest number, uh, and we that means we have to maintain them at a pretty high level to make sure that they. They stay at the high standard. Uh, these ecosystems are home to nearly a quarter of the state's rare species. So if these didn't exist, some of those, those rare species might not exist either. Some of the species we're talking about, these are all in the forest preserve. Bald eagles are nesting in the forest preserve. They have been for a number of years now, but they didn't for a long time. It was un unhealthy for them. Blanding's turtle, black, uh, black crowned uh, night heron, and the uh, North American river otter, who's gotten a lot of press in the last couple of years too, actually. He's been very... Uh, we actually have wildlife biologists that, that track a lot of these animals, we'll ban them, and we'll get a sense of where they are and their travel patterns, and it helps us to better support them uh, out in nature. <coughs> uh, we know that 30,000 number is, is, uh, is aggressive, uh, but again, we were thinking big in the spirit of Burnham. We recognize that we need to have high goals for ourselves. And the Next Century uh, Conservation Plan recommends big increases in our volunteer engagement and mobilizing people. One of the reasons I'm out here talking is I want more people to know what's available to them, that it is yours, uh, and that there is a role for you, whether you just want to recreate or if you want to volunteer. And so part of what we do is we really encourage volunteerism in the forest preserves to help us with our mission. Uh, another way that we do it is we introduce a lot of local youth to opportunities for future careers in conservation um, through our Conservation Corps. And so this is really is a conglomeration of a number of different programs with partner groups where we hire young people through internships or paid internships and they, they learn about restoring nature. Uh, kids come from all parts of the city and suburbs, so we really work hard to make sure that we recruit people from different places. Uh, and they get valuable skills about learning about conservation, but they get the basic job skills too, the soft skills that maybe this is their first job and they get a chance to learn about being on time for work and dressing appropriately and being prepared uh, for the work that's gonna lie ahead of them. And a, lot, a number of kids uh, embrace it and really embrace what we're doing and move on to, to other skills. Uh, one of those uh, great success stories is Lance Williams. So he joined the, the Chicago Conservation Leadership Corps and moved his way right up to crew leader in the Calumet region, which is um, out south. And for Lance, his initial exposure inspired his post high school dreams. He now plans to attend a university to major in environmental science with hopes of becoming a wildlife biologist. Uh, Conservation Corps crews are a great benefit to young adults who get paid and gain skills. And the Forest Preserve is all, also working to, to engage new volunteers to participate in stewardship activities. So we're always looking for folks who have a little time on their hands because we have something for you to do, for sure. And uh, uh, we find it's, uh, the folks who do volunteer for us find it very rewarding. Currently, the Forest Preserve has a network of 4,000 regular volunteers who dedicate their personal time to restoration. Jane Balaban, who's up in the corner there. Jane's been volunteering with the Forest Preserve since, uh, with the North Branch Restoration Project since 1980. Uh, she and many longtime stewards are caretakers at many sites across the county, leading volunteer work days and inspiring the next generation of Forest Preserve volunteers and advocates. Our nonprofit partners like Friends of the Forest Preserves also provide volunteers who do restoration work around the system as well. Uh, if you're interested in volunteering, their work days almost every weekend, Every weekend of the year, there are people working in the middle of winter, there's people working in summer. It's a great opportunity to meet uh, folks who are like-minded and are interested in doing something about our environment and taking care of it. Um, and there's also weekday opportunities as well. And you can sign up or get more information um, on our website. Um, now, conserving the land is the main deal, but we also recognize that everybody's gonna come out and do conservation work for us. Uh, we also recognize that recreation is a big part of who we are and who we should be. But our recreation is different. We're not doing basketball courts and baseball fields for the most part. We've got a couple of those floating around through some historic deals that uh, they shouldn't be there, but they're there kind of things. Um, but for the most part, our recreation is the sort of things that I'm gonna talk about now. So um, picnicking is the one everybody's really aware of, but 
Also, people use our, our lakes and ponds and canoe and kayak. Trail walking is huge. It's probably the biggest use people use in the trail is for birding and just uh, exercise. Um, but we've also introduced some new things like zip lining. And uh, certainly, uh, we've made a lot of investments in our existing infrastructure to better support uh, more people coming out and using the forest preserves um, to get outdoors. In an urban area like ours, it's not always a given that people will know what to do in nature. So we found that's true, too. A lot of folks have become very urbanized and lost some of their connection with nature, so we recognize that and we want to help them feel comfortable. We've been committed to finding new and exciting ways to help uh, people make this connection with, uh, with um, nature, and so you can do that through our nature centers, which are always, if you say, hey, I don't know anything about nature, where do I start? Start at a nature center. Uh, that's, uh, there's six of those around the county, and it's an opportunity to meet with staff who will educate you, take you on hikes, uh, teach you about sort of the wildlife that exists there. We have animals on site that we that we take care of and use as teaching animals uh, that have either somehow been injured or not able to survive on their own in nature. And it's a great way to start, and there's always good trails around the nature centers as well. But fishing, canoeing, kayaking, nature center special events, and more than 300 miles of trail. And one of my personal favorites, camping. Uh, so we introduced uh, camping. You used to be able to camp in the forest preserve years and years ago, more than 50 years ago, you could camp in the forest preserves. Uh, and for some reason, we stopped. Um, and uh, early on in my tenure working with President Preckwinkle, we talked about a lot of ways to reconnect people. And we, re we recognized that camping was a way to connect with a population of folks who maybe really like to camp or maybe have never tried camping, but they would do it if it were closer or more convenient. And so we, we, uh, we decided that's how we're going to go. So in 2015, we uh, reintroduced public camping for the first time in 50 years uh, with five new or revitalized campgrounds. The only people that were camping with us were the organized groups like the Scouts. And so they still, they still camp with us, but we've opened it up to a much broader public. Uh, so now any resident, anybody can uh, reserve a, a campground site, and it means you can pitch your tent if you're so inclined, or you can rent a cabin, or you can pull in your RV in a couple of sites if you have an RV. Um, all the cabins are new and uh, in really great shape. We have great bathroom and shower facilities because we know that's a big deal for people too. And um, it's really affordable. And uh, so we, we, use, we have, since we started opening them uh, up in 2015, we've had more than 100,000 visitors to our campgrounds. And of that 100,000, 54,000 were just last year alone. So it's grown exponentially over the past several years. And we expect the number to be really high this year as well. So people, there's a demand for it. People are willing to try it and people are always looking for affordable options for themselves and for their families. And so we see groups, we see families going out, we see groups going out, just getting away from their families. You see all the mixture of things. <laughs> see all kinds of fun things going on. Uh, and we, they, really are, they really are beautiful spaces and they really sort of immerse you in nature. Uh, we've also made significant investments in some of our more popular sites that have always historically been popular, like Swallow Cliff out in the Palos, uh, Palos Park area. Many people know Swallow Cliff for its 100-foot bluff, so it's one of the highest points in the county. Uh, and um, people, people come out there for the views, but they also come out for the uh, fitness stairs. It's been very popular. It used to, be a, a, used to be a tobogganing site historically before the toboggans went away. In 2016, we added a second set of stairs at Swallow Cliff, and, as well as a LEED Silver Certified uh, Pavilion and Cafe designed by Ross Barney Architects. A lot of you probably know Carol. Uh, which provides an intimate setting for birthday parties and wedding and baby showers, classes and meetings and other programming that we do out there. Imagine being fully immersed in nature, uh, taking in the sights and sounds of migrating songbirds and rustling leaves and at the same time getting a good workout. And this is an extremely popular site for that activity, it always has been. Um, and then finally we're identifying new sites that can help us achieve our conservation and recreation goals such as rolling knolls in Elgin. This is the site of a former golf course that we purchased in 2010, Alan probably knows about this one. Uh, he was here at the time. Um, the site was acquired back in 2010, as I mentioned. It was envisioned as a year-round outdoor recreation uh, space. The site includes a LEED Platinum Certified Pavilion designed by Fire and Associates, as well as a professional-level disc golf course. Uh, the pavilion was designed using sustainable design <laughs> standards, and a portion of the original clubhouse was incorporated in the design, reducing the need for new materials as well as connecting the new building to the site's history in the community. It's a big place for fish fries here. It's like, and so we're starting to actually allow that to happen, too. It's very interesting, the history for this site. Uh, recreational opportunities and programs in the forest preserves also help ourselves and our kids get healthier. It really is about healthy lifestyle. You know, that's a big push for a lot of folks. People are paying more attention to that. We think that being outdoors and being in nature is an easier way to do it. Uh, and um, 
a, uh, a way that really has a big impact on your health. I can attest to that myself. Um, Forest Preserves programming uh, also provides educational opportunities outside the classroom. So education is the other big third part of our mission, in addition to protecting the land and creating recre recreational opportunities. Um, providing education for people is really important. And so you learn about nature, but in a fun way. We have a lot, many, many school groups that come through the Forest Preserves and use our outdoor spaces and outdoor classroom. Um, you may not know that within the forest preserves is a 12,000 year old canyon. I did not say a Grand Canyon, but a canyon, and that's a <laughs> picture of it right there. That's the only one in Cook County, uh, and one of the few that exist anywhere in the region. Uh, and this is at, this, this is at a, um, one of our nature centers, Sagawa Environmental Learning Center. So you can go down there and get a tour of the canyon uh, if you're so inclined. Or that archaeological digs uncover tools used thousands of years ago. Uh, obviously, you, you probably know that Chicago, like a lot of places, the United States was populated before, native, before uh, settlers came here and it populated by native peoples. And the few places that you can find some of those sites still exist in the forest preserve because they've not been developed. And so uh, we have a responsibility and a plan to really sort of work with universities and others to make sure that we know where those sites are, that we protect them and allow for, allow for uh, interpretation as well. Uh, our program department educates attendees on important but historical events. There's a lot of culture in the Forest Preserve. Uh, everything ranging from a Juneteenth celebration at Sand Ridge, but we host events uh, with Native Americans. We've done Native American powwow for a number of years, uh, every other year or so. Jewish Folk Festival on the Northwest side. There's a lot of things that happen in the Forest Preserves culturally as well. We recognize culture is important to our story as well. Uh, nature and health is really important, obviously. Um, there's a lot of benefits to being out in nature, uh, health-wise and walking and volunteering and all those sorts of things, but also it's important that people understand that you know reducing stress, if you're downtown or in your neighborhood in the city, if you live in the city, getting away from nature, getting away from the city and getting into nature actually reduces stress, helps with uh, you know, your overall well-being. And so it's documented that spending that time is important. We actually work with a uh, Northwestern University professor who did a, a study studying a walk in the woods in the forest preserves compared to walking in Evans, downtown Evanston and put the indicators in everybody and it, it showed uh, in a very uh, data-driven way that you are healthier and you feel better and your blood pressure comes down and a lot of your health, your, your vitals are better when you're spending a, that, doing that walk in the forest preserves. So we knew that uh, anecdotally but we've got some data to, to support that as well. Overall, the nature has a, a huge impact on the local economy as well. Um, the Forest Preserves has generated over a one and a half billion total economic dollars uh, impact to Cook County over the last 13 years. $250 million annual value to residents from activities at, at Forest Preserve lands and facilities and has generated 1,600 annual jobs, not just in the Forest Preserve but through a, a, either uh, businesses that do business with the Forest Preserve or businesses that benefit from having a Forest Preserve so close. Uh, so not only are the Forest Preserve generating money, but they also save you money. Uh, if you spend any time in certain parts of the city or certain suburbs, you realize flooding is a huge issue. And uh, it would be a much bigger issue if the, there were no Forest Preserves because a lot of that rainwater currently goes to the Forest Preserve because uh, it's not going to go, all of it can't make it into the sewer system and certainly it cannot go into non-permeable surfaces. Um, so think about if there were no forest preserves, what would happen to that rainwater? We'd have much more issues and what does it cost to deal with these kinds of issues? These are real issues for people in, in big parts of the county. Um, when you drive past the forest preserve now, I hope that you think about them a little differently and maybe are inclined to venture in and try them out, you know, and check out our maps or our, our program guides and give you a sense of where to start. But the Forest Preserves offer clean water, clean air, education and job training opportunities, lower health, lowered health risks, protection for plants and animals. We do a lot of science and research working with our own staff, but also with local universities and, and hospitals. Uh, flood prevention. These are called ecosystem services and the estimated value of these uh, benefits over $469 million annually. Um, now, we have to pay for all that, and I will, I will make the argument that this is the best deal in town for any local government, and I'll tell you why. 
less than 1% of your property tax bill, depending on where you live, a little bit less in some places, a little bit more in others, but right around 1% goes to the forest preserve system of Cook County. That includes the support we give to the Brookfield Zoo and the Chicago Botanic Garden. For an average homeowner, it's about $45 a year annually for out of your property tax bill, less than $4 a month. This is significantly less than what you might be paying for things that could be done in the forest preserves if you think about it. So if you compare that to a gym membership, if you go to a gym, uh, gym memberships, you know, $636, we just created some numbers around that. Um, the average Chicagoan spends more than $3,700 on entertainment. If you're going out to see Hamilton, it's gonna jack it up right, right there. <laughs> just bought those tickets uh, this past uh, February for my wife for her birthday. Um, <clears throat> and, so you're getting a good deal. There's a lot happening here, and we think you know we do a lot with a little, and a lot of it's done with partners and support. Uh, our next century conservation plan, to get back to that, though, is very ambitious. We're saying we want to do a lot, and we want to ramp up the restoration. We want to get more people out. We want to do more programming. Uh, to fully uh, implement the next century conservation plan, we're going to need more resources than we have today. So I, I just want to be clear that we have a plan. We feel like we've had a lot of success with the resources we've had, but there's a lot more to do. Uh, we've been working very hard to, to bridge uh, the gap that of by an expanding non-tax revenue. So we, you know we have more concession opportunities. We have uh, certainly uh, generate revenue through utilities that run through the forest preserve. There's different ways to sort of cut into that, but at the end of the day, uh, I think there's an argument to be made for supporting public lands. That most of that really does need to come from the, the general public, and that's true for I would say for the national parks, but that's also true for us as well. Uh, local support and advocacy for this natural resource is really uh, key and uh, the continued preservation of this land and our natural uh, and cultural heritage and the most important thing is mostly important for our well-being as well. So it's really connected. We're really working hard to connect more people to it. And I would say, how can you help? I'll give you my ask. Um, participate, advocate, and support. So participate by coming to events, get out there and enjoy it. It's, uh, you know, I know not everybody's driving, but there's ways to get out there. Uh, and certainly uh, we work with organizations to, to provide transportation in some cases if there's enough people who are interested, but really we'd love to get you out, participate. We have a number of special events, which you can see in the program guide. We do a program guide on a quarterly basis. So the summer one will be coming out soon and you can find that on the website when it does. Um, you can volunteer, uh, and I think that's a very, if you talk to anybody who volunteers for us, they find it very rewarding and like to do it. Uh, and you can sign up for our newsletter and follow us on social media if you're so inclined. Uh, you can advocate by spreading the word to friends and family, uh, local elected officials, decision makers, key influencers, or just friends. You know, I think it's important to let people know what's available to them and why it's important and support and you can support by giving your time uh, you can support we have a forest preserve foundation that supports some of the program initiatives that i talked about with the conservation corps and some of the other programming that we do uh, you can support that through the foundation as well and that is my presentation but i want to again thank you for taking the time to come out and hear what we had to say and i, I think we're going to do some q a after this Sure. Um, yeah. Um, so we operate. Um, we operate after we allocate dollars to both, to both the zoo and the garden, which is both are long-term arrangements that have existed for decades, almost 100 years for the zoo. We operate on about 63 million dollars a year for the forest preserve system for this 70,000 acres, and that uh, pays the salaries of the 550 plus. Uh, full-time staff and then some seasonal staff that we bring on to do to do landscape maintenance uh, and all the programming and the nature centers and all that. Um, if we're just going to continue to do what we're doing today, uh, that's not sustainable just for because the reality of increasing costs and just the, the cost of doing business has gone up and will continue to go up. Uh, to do the next century conservation plan, the, the big long-term plan, uh, if we 
if we're getting $45 per household per year, if we were to increase that number um, by half or double that number, we would be able to enact to do all the things in the next century conservation plan, which I would encourage you to read. Uh, you've got a copy of the executive summary, but it really talks about purchasing more land over time. It talks about restoring more land, so that 30,000 acres. Uh, those are all things that we can do a little bit of, and we have been doing, and I think we, we'd be glad to talk about what our track record has been in the last almost eight years uh, of doing that, but it's not sustainable in the long term. And for us, if we're not getting additional public resources at some level, um, we won't be able to support the number of staff that we have. And I will just tell you that the forest preserves up until 2002 or so was double the staff that it is today. Uh, and there was major reductions in 2002. And I think they sort of went underground after that. You know, they weren't able to do some of the things, but we have really feel like we've tried to maximize uh, the programming and uh, we've spun off some of those things. So the campgrounds are, are run, uh, they're programmed by us, but they're run by, by a, a third party that can do a better job of making sure that, that people are getting in and out and getting the service, they, the service they need. We do more concessions. So we're gonna need more resources to enact that plan. Uh, certainly, and we will need more resources to even do what we're doing now for the long term. It's, it's sort of a, um, it's, uh, we're at a place where we're operating, doing a lot on a little, and it's not sustainable for the long term. Uh, Alan? I was curious, um, I used to work there. Um, so Alan used to be the planning director for many years before I got there. Um, how are you going to measure progress of the conservation plan? <laughs> and then the second part is having a conservation plan, how is that going to uh, accelerate conservation? Yeah. So um, a lot of plans get done and then they get put on a shelf. That's not what's happening with our next century conservation plan. We actually have an active committee structure uh, for each section of the plan uh, made up of people who don't work for, there are, for, there are Forest Preserve staff on each of those committees, but they're predominantly made up of people who don't work for the Forest Preserve, who are advocates who have a, you know, an interest in what we're doing, people from the business community, people from conservation, people from all walks of life, people from education, uh, from healthcare, that, that sit on those committees and help put measurables on paper and saying These are, this is how we know we're gonna be successful because we've accomplished this or this and, and, and set very specific goals, which then get rolled into our budget and they actually make recommendations on our budget. So this is a group that's appointed uh, and uh, there's a, a group that's appointed that really looks at all these things and, and makes recommendations on our budget and how we spend our money. And so there's outside advocates looking at us, working with us to make sure that we're doing it so we don't go off the rails and start putting in roller coasters or something. You know, I mean, it's really to make sure we're doing the right thing so we can measure our success. And I think that's really important. Measuring success is important to, to know if you're doing it, if you're being successful or not. Any other hand? Um, would you restate that last part for yeah, me? I'm just wondering, having a conservation plan, <laughs> how is that going to accelerate basically conservation restoration? So I think, you know, part of the plan is really sort of making sure that people understand why conservation is important. So I think that's a big, education is a huge part of it. I think uh, a lot of people don't recognize that having natural areas and having a tree that's down in the middle of a natural area is important because it's part of an ecosystem and habitat and there's, there's snakes and bugs and animals that live in there. and I think we've been, um, and I had, I had the same issue when I worked for the parks. If it's not mowed and, and picked up, then it's not being maintained. That's not the truth. We, you know, that's, that's, uh, there are places where that's appropriate, but for us, it's really about having these healthy places uh, where things exist and it you know, helps with all the other things I talked about with water. So I think education is a big part in just building up a broader awareness and getting more people connected. You know, the more people that are connected to it uh, and get it, uh, the better off we're all gonna be. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> other than the Botanic Gardens and Brookfield Zoo, are there any other of the preserves that are accessible by public transportation? Yes, there are. Um, so the northwest side of Chicago has an extensive uh, preserve system that runs along the North Branch Chicago River. So you, you can get to most of those, Foster and Devon, those mm -hmm. are all places that you can get to by public transportation. Uh, on the um, southwest side of the city out in Beverly is Dan Ryan Woods. and uh, you can get to that by public transportation. And on the southeast side of the city, Chicago, out Eggers and, uh, and um, 
I'm blanking out on the other one, but those are all accessible by public transportation. Once you get to some of those, you can actually get on the trail, and if you have a bike, and, and I'm excited to say we're actually working with Bike and Roll Chicago to have it, uh, 500 additional bikes put into our system starting this summer, so I'm excited about that. So even if you don't have a bike, you can rent a bike on site and you can ride some of those trails and then we'll take you out into the suburbs in a bigger forest preserve system as well. Uh, public transportation to most of the system is not good enough and we know that, but that's not something we have direct control over, but something we certainly will advocate for over time to have better public transportation. But there are places you can reach and uh, I would encourage you to try to get to them. So I'm repeating part of my question, but I want you to go deeper. What are some of your favorite um, uh, parks or where are some surprises that we should go out and discover? Yeah. Uh, so that's always a really tough question to say, what's my, it's like picking your favorite child or whatever. Um, um, but I would, I, I talk a lot about the Palos area, so we had a picture of Swallow Cliff, but that, the Palos area, which is out in Palos Park, Whitlow Springs, that area, is almost 25,000 acres of contiguous forest preserve land. So that's the biggest single area block of forest preserves that you'll find anywhere in the county. So that's always a good place to start. And there's a lot of really cool stuff happening there. So we've got a couple of camp, we got a campground going out there. We have a couple of nature centers. We have rolling hills. We have several lakes, uh, ponds, and sloughs. Uh, the trail system is incredible. You see a lot of people running the trails. Uh, a lot of you see a lot of cross country teams running the trails. So there's a lot of paved trail, but there's also a lot of unpaved trail. You can really get lost in a good way out in, in the Palos area, uh, and a lot of fun. And you'll find all sorts of really interesting things. You'll find. Uh, you know, eagles nesting, you'll find all sorts of birding opportunities out in Palos. The north branch of the of the, the Chicago River, our north branch trail is extremely pop, probably the most popular trail uh, in our system and a, a lot of that has to do with just its proximity to the city and uh, how many city residents. And we expanded another three miles in, into the city uh, last year, so we're excited about that too. Uh, but there's all these places that, you know, we're going to start in our program guide, we're going to start having five the five five interesting hikes to take and it'll start with our summer brochure so it'll give you some ideas of where to start uh, if you want to do some hikes or get out in, in the nature so they're all over the place there's I find I've been doing this job seven and a half years now and I still find very interesting places um, even places that I've been to before but you see it at a different season and it's very interesting so you can't go wrong and uh, it's always a good day I always say uh, I was, it's always a better day for me when I'm not dressed like this and I'm walking around <laughs> and I'm walking around out in the forest preserve doing my job out there. So. Okay, I want to thank you all for the good to see you out there.